Just a horrific, horrific thing for people to have to go through. We do have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to hear more from Donna and from Carl. But as I said, we're also going to be joined by some experts who are going to give us some insight into how you could deal if you've been faced with a horrific loss. And believe me, we're also going to give you some signs. If you are contemplating suicide or know someone who's showing suicidal tendencies, please stay with us. We're going to try to help you recognize those and prevent this from ever happening again. In the time it takes for you to watch this television show, someone somewhere in America will have taken his own life. Every 16 minutes, someone commits suicide. Most likely to kill themselves? Men between 24 and 65 or older. Teens who make a split-second life-altering decision and people who suffer from depression or substance abuse. These are leading causes for suicide. For those who kill themselves, they may think the pain is over, but for the millions of family members, loved ones, friends, and co-workers they leave behind, the pain is just beginning. This show is dedicated to those survivors. I'm Lynn Doyle. We've met Donna and Carl. They're both individuals who uh, had a loved one take his or her own life. We are giving you the opportunity later in the show to tell us how you've been impacted as well. Carl actually inspired me to do this show because he's written a new book about his brother's suicide, which uh, incidentally was in 1965, not 1973, as I stated earlier. It's called Bader Field. What did you hope to accomplish by putting your experience and that of your family into words? Um, actually hoping to save lives, hoping that someone who is in a state of despair would actually get past that or realize what they do to their families and that they don't die alone. And just to get the word out there, I mean, ultimately I'd love for this book to be in high schools, junior high schools, high schools and, and colleges and be made to be mandatory reading so that they would see the impact of, of suicide on a family and just to let them know that life goes on and as bad as today might be, tomorrow's another day. Is there a way that you can characterize briefly how it did impact your family, what it did to it? You told us before the break that it did not break you apart, it actually brought you together, but what's been the the lasting result? Well, the lasting result is the, is the pain that, that lingers, that stays with you. I mean, it's a, it's a wound that gets a scab and it heals and the slightest little trigger rips it wide open again. So that goes on. Donna, would you agree with that? Would you say that that, that is um, a description that applies to your life as well, a wound that gets ripped away? Absolutely, and it can be anything. I mean, from a holiday to an anniversary to a TV program. And in my case, the violent nature, um, watching movies with guns and suicides on TV. You just don't know what is going to set you off or what can you know, bring back all those memories. And people kind of have expected you to move on at this point, right? Is um, that is that a, a common thread? Absolutely. The, it seems like some people think there's a book and these are the steps that you're supposed to take. And you should be done crying at six months. Right. You should be sleeping soundly by eight months. You know, and it doesn't work that way. You're here to say it's not the way it goes. No. We um, did tell you that if you have questions or comments that we would invite you to uh, share those with us, you can write to me directly at lynn at lynndoyle.net. If you do have a question or comment, we will pass those along to each of the guests and hopefully they'll be able to respond to you. I want to bring in our experts now because we do want this show to be meaningful and we want to give you some answers to some questions that you might have. And for that, we brought in two of the best. Joanne Hoffman is a Professor Emeritus at Rutgers University. She's been a volunteer trained listening specialist with contact of Mercer County, New Jersey for 28 years. During that time, she's listened to men, women, and teens who wanted to live in their lives. She's currently the organization's director of training interns and apprentices. Also back with us, an old friend of the show, Ed Conboy. He's a staff therapist at the Council for Relationships over the years, has given us a lot of great advice. But I want to turn to Joanne first because, you know, I have personally been involved with contact of Mercer County for many, many years, and I admire the work that you all do. I can't imagine for 28 years listening to as many people as you have who wanted to end their life. How difficult is that? Very. It's very difficult um, because we do become involved with that person emotionally. We are listening to them, and we're trying to do everything we can to get them into a safe place, to get them to stop at least for this hour or this day and to convince them that there is another thing, that there is a way out, but to just stop and think about it. And that's the, 
the hardest thing to do, to be compassionate and empathetic and non-judgmental and hold on. Does your experience and research indicate that it's usually a split second decision when someone takes his or her own life or is it as a result of, of a long process? A little bit of both. Most of the people that we talk to when they start, they've been depressed or they're suffering grief or there's been a problem in their life, there's a loss and so they're constantly worrying this and it's like a wound and you keep scratching at it and so it gets worse and worse and worse. But then there's got to be one point at one time where they say, okay, this is it. I can't do it anymore. I want out. And when they call us, this is, they're calling for that help to stop. Thank God something like contact is there for yes. people to reach out to. But Ed, if they don't know it, you know, what else can we offer to these people if they don't know that there's a national hotline or a local group like Contact? How can we as, as friends and loved ones help? Well, that's part of our responsibility as part of that larger network to have that information available. And as Carl was talking about, to be able to talk about this with, with young people, with elderly folks, to bring this out in the open so it's not as the secrecy is gone and the stigma is removed, to really begin to, to make it more public. And this is why this is really great to have books like this and conversations like this, because so often it's one of those unspeakables. Well, it is. It's unspeakable. And it's even difficult for those who hear about it because you don't know what to say to the person who's, who's lost a loved one to a, a suicide completion. It's very difficult when you're on the outside. It really is, and, and the whole grieving process is so much more complicated because in these cases, unlike a homicide where there's a clear victim, here the victim is the perpetrator. And that makes this whole, the whole way that we grieve about it very complicated, and there's a way to begin to work through that with some professional help and with some other really wonderful supportive programs out there. I have to ask this question because, you know, I'm sure people at home are wondering, all of us go through tough times. I mean, there's not a soul who's watching this show or sitting at this desk or in this studio anywhere that hasn't had something bad happen to them. They've lost a loved one, they lost a job, you know, maybe they got arrested. I mean, not everyone considers or completes a suicide. So why is it that some people are more vulnerable to it and how do we know who those people are? I mean, Donna said she was taken kind of by surprise by this. In your book, you say you didn't have any indication your brother would do this. How do we know that someone that we love is not thinking about it? Well, there are some signs that as we've continued to study suicide that we look at, um, people, their whole attitude changes. If they were sort of a messy person, all of a sudden they get really, really clean. Their appetite changes or maybe their attitudes change. Things change. And most people see the changes, but they're afraid to say, you know, you've been talking funny, you've been organizing things or disorganizing. I have to ask, are you thinking of killing yourself? Oh my gosh, what if you ask that and the person looks at you and says, are you crazy? I mean, oh, that's good. you may offend them forever. True, but they'll still be there. But if it's not, if they actually are thinking about it, they'll say, oh, thank God somebody saw that. I need to talk about it, and that's the beginning. And it is okay to talk about it. We it's, don't have uh, to go to a therapist. We can just talk amongst talk, ourselves. We can talk amongst ourselves, but we can also tell people, look, there are other places. You know, I'm, an, I'm a trained listener, but there are therapists. There are people to help you, as well as somebody who just listen. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is if someone I care about tells me that, then what do I do? Do I go on 24-hour watch over them? But I don't know the answer. If you have that same question, you'll have to stay with us because I'm gonna get it on the other side of this break. We'll be right back. This is a very important show. Please stay with us. If you know someone or suspect someone that you think is suicidal, we're gonna give you some advice when we come back.